Hey friends, Ash here with GentSense. Hope that you're doing well. So I've seen a lot of comments lately, also gotten some emails from you guys who are just starting to get into fragrances or trying to learn about fragrances or colognes, whatever you want to call it. And uh, you're a bit confused. And I get it when you first start getting into fragrances, there's this whole vernacular, this vocabulary that gets thrown around that makes no sense unless you're kind of into this hobby. So in today's video, I'm gonna be going over some really common fragrance terms and defining it in simplistic ways to help people out that are maybe just starting to learn about stuff. That way, when they hear something, they don't go, I don't, I don't know what that is. So let's jump into it. Let's tackle some common fragrance terms and figure out what they mean. One of the things that apparently confuses people the most is flanker. What is a flanker? So flanker may not make a whole lot of sense when you hear it thrown around the first few times. Flanker, I don't know what that is. You know, somebody holds up a fragrance and they go, this is a flanker. Flanking what? But it's easy to understand. This is just an addition to an already existing fragrance line. That's the easiest way that you could think of it. So for example, so for example, Mont Blanc Explorer, this is the original in the Explorer line right here, the OG. Now Mont Blanc Explorer Ultra Blue, this is a flanker of this. So this is an addition, a new entry to an already existing fragrance line. Mont Blanc Explorer is the original, Explorer Ultra Blue is a flanker. And if they were to come out with Explorer Ultra Red or Explorer Super Fresh or some ridiculous new fragrance in this line, that would also be a flanker of Explorer. Then of course, you can also have flankers of flankers. So it can go deeper than that. As an example, Aqua de Jo, this is the original Giorgio Armani Aqua de Jo. Then you had the flanker Aqua de Jo Absolute. And then after that, Aqua de Jo Absolute Instinct. So now you have a flanker of a flanker because this was the original, which led to Absolute, which then had Absolute Instinct. Oh boy. I should throw out there that some people do not consider an eau de parfum version of a fragrance as a true flanker, whereas I am a more of the mindset that, yeah, it is a flanker. So as a quick example there, Mont Blanc Legend, this is the eau de toilette, Legend, the eau de parfum. Some people would say, hey, the eau de parfum, that's not really a flanker, but I kind of think it is. So that one, really up to personal interpretation, but now you know what a flanker is. Next up, a clone. Yeah, a lot of you out there, uh, apparently not exactly sure what a clone fragrance is. So a clone fragrance is a fragrance that is made to smell the same as a more expensive fragrance done typically at a more affordable price point. And oftentimes they're made by a company that specializes solely in clone fragrances or predominantly in clone fragrances, we'll say. So as an example, Creed Aventis. This is an ultra popular niche fragrance that's very expensive. The most well-known clone of that scent is this one, Club de Nuit Intense Man from Armav. So essentially, if you're talking about a clone fragrance, you're talking about something that is trying to smell very, very, very similar to something else that's typically much more expensive. So it's a way that guys can get something, or girls can get something that smells like a more expensive fragrance on the cheap. Of course, that opens up a whole can of worms where you have some people that hate clones, other people that love clones, but now you know what a clone is. Then we have, what I like to call inspired by fragrances. So these are maybe fragrances that aren't exactly a clone, but you can tell that they're very much inspired by another existing, usually very popular fragrance. So as an example, Mont Blanc Explorer, going back to this one, this is inspired by Creed Aventus. Oops. When you smell them side by side, you can go, oh yeah, there's similarities there. And you can look at the presentation even on this one and see, you know, that there's a little bit of a similar color scheme. But inspired by fragrances, I wouldn't call clones necessarily. They're not trying to 100% emulate the fragrance they're inspired by, uh, but they are clearly inspired by 
the other fragrance. Now, some people don't make that delineation as much. They'll just lump everything into one group and say, nah, they're all clones. But I think that's a little bit too reductive. Next up, let's talk about concentrations. Yes. So for people first getting into fragrances, they will typically refer to a woman's fragrance as a perfume and a man's fragrance as a cologne. So that's kind of a holdover from the past. Nowadays, uh, I like to call pretty much everything a fragrance personally, just because concentrations run the gamut, whether we're talking men's or women's or unisex fragrances. But of course, if you still want to call uh, a men's fragrance a cologne, I mean, nobody's going to think badly of you. But the concentrations themselves, going from weakest to strongest, or at least the ones that you may run across, are eau fraiche, eau de cologne, eau de toilette, eau de parfum, and then what you'll see as extrait de parfum, pure parfum, or parfum, depending on the fragrance and sometimes the concentration. So eau fraiche is the weakest. Typically, the concentration of that is going to be under 2%. And a lot of times, those don't really have a whole lot of uh, alcohol, perfumers alcohol in them. Instead, they'll have water, and they're, they're more like a body mist almost. Then you have eau de cologne. Those are typically between 2 and 5% roundabout in terms of uh, concentration, and eau de colognes are, are quite Quite weak. They don't last very long and you're not going to see really many at all on the market. You may see something like Atelier Cologne and see on there that it's Eau de Cologne Intense Concentration or something like that, but those aren't actually Eau de Colognes. It's more a play on words. When they say Eau de Cologne Intense, those are more like Eau de Parfum concentrations. So it's, uh, it's a whole thing. Then you have Eau de Toilette, which is the next step up from there. And those uh, typically are in that 10% range in terms of concentration. Uh, depending on where you look, you can find a lot of different percentages also. Then you have Eau de Parfum. Those are typically going to be 15%, maybe up to 20. And then uh, Extrait de Parfum is going to be above that. Now, like I said, it depends on where you look. Some places will say Eau de Toilette is 5 to 10% and then they'll say uh, eau de parfum is 10 to 15 and they'll say anything above that is extrait de parfum but uh it really is dependent on the source as to what kind of percentage you're going to get so you could think of it more as a generalization and uh, they go in in that order as far as weak to strong eau fraiche eau de cologne eau de toilette eau de parfum and then parfum also uh, the name of a fragrance does not denote the concentration so keep that in mind. For example, Versace Man Eau Fraiche. That's not an Eau Fraiche. That's not Eau Fraiche concentration, I should say. It's just the name given to the fragrance. So don't see something that says like cologne, for example, uh, Allure Homme Sport Cologne and go, oh, Allure Homme Sport Cologne. That means it's an eau de cologne. That means it's gonna last 20 minutes. No, that's just the name. A lot of times with naming conventions, they'll give it a name like cologne just to make it get across that, that feeling of freshness a little bit more in the name. And I know this is like a, a big, Big thing with the concentrations, blah, blah, blah. But also a higher concentration does not automatically mean better projection. So keep that in mind. There are some fragrances where yes, a higher concentration version of the fragrance has better projection, better longevity, but there are a lot of circumstances and different fragrances where the higher concentration actually underperforms versus the lower concentration. So keep that in mind. Now let's talk really quickly about notes. Yeah, so there are top notes, also known as head notes. There are mid notes, also known as heart notes, and base notes, also known as bottom notes. So essentially the way they, they break those out is the top notes are going to be your notes that you pick up right away when you first spray it on off the top and they typically dissipate very quickly. So that's gonna be stuff like citrus or some other different uh, fruit notes. Uh, they're basically aroma chemicals and molecules that are very volatile. So they, they dissipate off the skin quickly. Then you have your mid notes, which is typically going to be uh, spices, florals, aromatics, things like that. Your base notes are your heavier denser notes with the most staying power. Those are going to be woods, musks, mosses, uh, some ambers, resins, things like that. So all those notes, they make up the scent profile of the fragrance that you're smelling. And if you want to think of it in a really simple way, the top notes are going to be gone first and then the mid notes and then the base notes. And so the fragrance will change as those notes dissipate off your skin. Next up, we'll define sillage, projection, longevity, uh, especially sillage. I think a lot of people, they hear that and they go, I don't know what that is. Sounds French. Um, easiest way to think of it is a lingering scent trail as you move around. So if I were to walk from here to the other end of the room, 
the sillage that I leave behind, the scent trail, that's what we're talking about. So the sillage of your fragrance, if it has a great sillage, that means as you're moving around, it's really going to, to fill up the areas where you were, where you move through. If it has a very weak sillage, not so much. Then there is projection, which is not the same thing as sillage. Uh, sometimes they're used interchangeably, but they're technically not supposed to be the same thing. They don't mean the same thing. Projection is what it says it is. It's how far off your skin or your clothing the fragrance projects. So if you have something that projects very weakly, you know, it's just sitting right around you like a little scent bubble. And if it's projecting out heavily, then people feed away are gonna be able to smell you. And <laughs> if you have a lot of it on, people on the other side of the room are gonna be able to smell you. And then longevity is also what it says it is. How long the fragrance lasts on your skin and sometimes clothing uh, does last typically longer on cloth than skin. Next up, we'll talk about anosmia or going anosmic. That will sometimes come up in reviews and that just means nose blindness. So basically that means your nose has tuned the fragrance out, but it's still there. And uh, your brain does this with all kinds of things. For example, your nose, your nose is always there. You can see it if you do that, there it is. But because it's always there, your, your brain just tunes it out. So you don't even notice that your nose is there when you're you know, going about your day looking around. Same kind of thing with fragrances. Certain fragrances, especially if they're overwhelmingly strong and maybe you overdid it a bit, they'll make you go nose blind and then you'll think, oh, it's not there, I, I can't smell it, it's gone, the performance is trash. And then you'll walk into a room and somebody will be like, oh. <laughs> yeah, you went nose blind and you devastated the person uh, that just caught that big whiff. So if you hear anybody talk about anosmia, going anosmic, whatever, just means going nose blind. Some fragrances do have a tendency to make you nose blind, whereas others may not. So next let's touch on an accord, what an accord is. So an accord is a blend of notes or ingredients used to put across a, a particular scent. So as an example, uh, leather or pineapple or amber, you can't actually distill oils from those things. You can't take leather and, and ring it into a bottle and be like, I made leather extract <laughs> and then put that into a fragrance. Same thing with amber. Amber is not something that you can take and distill and make into a scent. So instead you use a combination of other molecules or ingredients and you put them together and through the wizardry of perfumery, you come out with something that smells like leather or as amber would be perceived to smell which is warm, resinous, and sweet. If you hear somebody talk about an accord, that's what they mean. It's taking multiple things and blending it together to come out with something that smells like X, Y, or Z. You may also hear somebody talking about a fragrance as being gourmand. And then you think to yourself, what is, what it, uh, like gourmet? Yes, pretty much. A gourmand fragrance has an edible quality to it. So it might be something that smells like uh, honey or coffee or caramel or chocolate, something that you would eat. So when you smell the fragrance, you go, oh, that smells like I could eat it. It smells that good. So that means it's gourmand. A fragrance that has that edible kind of essence to it, edible essence, that's a gourmand. Dry down, if you ever hear that, don't know what that is. Basically the dry down is the longest part of the fragrance's lifespan. Once the top notes have dissipated for the most part and uh, the fragrance settles in and stays the same way for a number of hours, that's typically what people would consider the dry down. The final longest lasting part of the fragrance. And then we could also get into the fragrance families, but that would take take a while. And I'm not sure I wanna delve into that right now. So if you wanna look the, the fragrance families up and what makes up each fragrance family, feel free to, to Google that, or maybe I'll do something in the future on it. There's also a fragrance wheel that some people use now. So the fragrance wheel is fresh, floral, ambery, and woody. It goes around like that and shows how each fragrance family kind of evolves to lead into the next one. And then you have um, the more traditional families of fragrances, which there's uh, more of those, uh, not just four. There's a lot of stuff we could break down there from fougeres to chifras to uh, aromatics, which is tied in with fougeres and then orientals, which are now known as ambers, uh, woodies, citrus fragrances, leather fragrances, whole lot of stuff. Uh, and I, I just, don't want this video to run like crazy in terms of length, so feel free to look that up. All right, guys, there we have it. Some of the more common fragrance terms to find for beginners. So if you didn't know what some of this stuff meant, hopefully this has been helpful. And if not, feel free to 
Google it. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff out there. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me. Thank you for hanging with me. Thanks for all your support. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you guys tomorrow with another fragrance video. See you later.